Well, good morning. Welcome to Redemption Hill Church. If you're new with us this morning, my name is Aaron, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill. Well, at this point, uh, we want to turn to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time as we look to his word for guidance. So please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with just a, a mix of emotions. We celebrate this morning these, these children and this opportunity to consecrate our children to you. We come together this, this week with celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and uh, aware of your grace and your kindness in so many ways. But we also come, Father, as, as John mentioned earlier, with sober hearts, aware of pain and misery this week, aware that there is injustice in the world, that there is brokenness all about us. There are people this morning, God, who are rejoicing, but there are also people this morning, God, who are weeping, who are grieving and mourning. And so, Father, this morning, we feel our need for you. We feel our lack, our insufficiency. And so, Lord, we turn to the sufficient one, the one to whom all help comes. You are the one. You are the source of wisdom. You are the source of justice. You are the source of joy and love and laughter. And so, Father in heaven, you see all. You know all. You know what we need. So speak to us now, Father, by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our series in Ephesians. So if you brought your Bibles, and I hope you did, please turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Uh, we are just plodding along through the book, and this morning we'll be looking at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5 in Ephesians. Please read along with me. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, this morning we appropriately spent time in our, in our corporate time of prayer uh, before the service, praying for the events of this week, praying for our nation, praying for the world, praying for the brokenness all around us. Uh, we spent time praying as John led us uh, in contemplating how to respond and, and praying for God to work. Uh, and that's appropriate. We want to pray. We want to continue to pray. But we also want to, we also want to you know, be agents of redemption in a world filled with brokenness, in a world that needs God. We want to be used of God. And so this morning, we looked at his word. And in the passage this morning, it's not, it's not difficult to, to get what Paul is after, what he's pleading for and exhorting the church in Ephesus too, and by extension and implication, what he's calling us to do this morning. What Paul is calling us to, uh, it doesn't require you know, any, any great seminary degree or anything like that to identify. It's right here in these words. Uh, the first part of, of verse 2, Paul says, walk in love. Well, over the past several months, we have been studying this book together, and we have divided the book, or we've identified how the book is divided. The first half of the book is primarily doctrine. The first, book, the first half of the book is primarily teaching us about God, teaching us about who we were, who we are, the new identity that we have in Christ, and what we're called to. And then the second half of the book, starting in chapter 4, is about practice. It's, it's taking our doctrine and what we, you know, how we're to behave, how we're to live and as a result. And we've pointed out that our, our behavior is always, it's ne never a, merely moralism. It's never just being good or doing good. But our behavior is shaped by what we believe. So our practice is fueled by our doctrine. So we always want to remember that. You know, this is one letter. You know, Paul wrote it and, you know, initially we would read this in one sitting. Uh, many of us do read this in one sitting. It takes like 20 minutes. So... Chapter 5 came just after chapter 4, which came just after chapter 3, and we never want to forget that. So we never want to remove it from the context of the book. So now we have this verse, or you know, these verses in chapter 5. And so with, with kind of with full apostolic authority, Paul is calling us 
to something amazing. There's no greater call that you have in Scripture than what he calls us to here. When he says, be imitators of God, well, that's like the summary of everything that we could ever be called to, right? What we've been studying the last few weeks about you know, being tenderhearted and loving and kind, uh, forgiving one another. You know, all of that is encapsulated, is summarized here in these two verses. So these two verses, really, you know, they're, they're really the conclusion and the summary of the previous verses. And so he calls us to imitate God, to walk in love. And he's doing this not primarily, he's, he's, remember, he's speaking this, he's addressing this letter to the church. So this is our corporate identity. This, are, this is our corporate call and a corporate exhortation. It's not primarily to individuals. It is to individuals because individuals make up the church. But this is a corporate call to imitate God, to walk in love, to be like him, to reflect his love to a lost and dying world. And think about this for a moment. You know, we never want to forget what we're doing here. This book... This book was written by Paul as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. So God guided Paul as he wrote this, and then he preserved that letter and helped it to get to the churches that it went to, and then he preserved it down through the centuries until, until it was included in this book that you and I hold in our hands today and that we look to along with churches around the city and the country. Churches around the world and throughout history have looked to God's word, this source of divine counsel and wisdom. This is God's self-revelation of himself, all for the purpose to speak to us, to help us to know what it means to be the church, what it means to be God's people. And this is what it means to be God's people. It means that we are, we are deeply committed to one another. We are going to do life together. We make commitments together like we did this morning with our children. We commit to raising our children in the Lord together in the church. So we want to come alongside one another and encourage each other. It means faithfully walking together, committed to each other in love. Love. Walk in love. Live together in love. Reflect love to one another. So what is this love? We hear that a lot, right? God is love. You hear that in the world a lot of times. We will share, share the gospel with people, and people say, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really like that. My God is just, he's just a God of love. Or, you know, you hear people talking about loving one another or being in love. Well, what is love? You define it a lot of different ways, right? You look in the dictionary, you, you talk to anybody on the street, and you get different answers. Some people think of love as primarily an emotional-based concept. You think of it as something that you feel or something that you fall into or fall out of. So it's a feeling-based idea, but the problem is that, what, feelings change, right? Circumstances change. What happens when you don't feel overflowing affection for someone? Then again, we can also veer off in a different direction. Love can be, some others might respond to this and re react against this and say, well, love is primarily an action. It's an action-based idea. It's something that you do. Love is something that you do and how you act. It's a decision, not, it's not what you feel. So what is it? Is it one of those? Is it both of those? Is it more than that? What is this thing that God's word is saying should characterize us as a church? Because that's what he means when he says walk in love. He's saying that it should characterize us. Love, walking in love, should characterize our life together. It should characterize our lives. It should characterize our interactions with one another in the church and in the world. So this morning, we want to get a biblical picture of what this love means. And what we will see is that those who have experienced the love of God, the church, okay, those of us who have been redeemed, who have known Jesus Christ, who have confessed faith in him, who have experienced the love of God, those who have experienced the love of God are called to reflect the love of God. We're called to be imitators of God. We're called to walk in love. We're called to reflect the love of God. And I want to say something to you at the outset this morning, and I, I feel this every time that I'm up here with you or every time I sit with you or talk with you. Um, you know, this, one of the challenges that the preacher faces is combating each week the facade of the expert. So I am no expert up here this morning. I am no expert at imitating God. I'm no expert at walking in love. You know me, and you have experienced my failing and my weakness uh, in this. And so this morning, try, you know, try as I might this week, as I thought about this passage, I mean, I was in this high and lofty place. Maybe you've been there, you read the scripture, and you're excited to apply, and I was excited to apply 
thinking about this every day, thinking about walking in love. I'm going to walk in love. And people are going to know me by my love. And they're going to be thinking about my love. And they're going to be coming up to me saying constantly, you know, give me the reason for the hope that you have because of your love. And daily, every, every day I was faced with my inadequacy and my insufficiency and my weakness. Uh, I was faced with sin and conflict and relationships, you know, all around. And my initial response was, was sometimes love and patience and kindness and goodness. And then sometimes it was not. It was anger and, and frustration and self-righteousness. So this morning, I just, I just feel like I've, I've, you know that. I know it's not new to you. Nobody's like, oh, wow, Aaron's not, like, you know, just like God. <laughs> I know you're agreeing with me. It's like, obviously, but I'm preaching this message first to myself because I need this. I need this truth. I need God's word to speak to my heart. And I know you do too. I know you need this word from God. So let's ask, so let's now look to God in seeking to apply and understand this word to our lives. So first off, in verse one, chapter five, Ephesians. We're called to be imitators of God. So what comes to mind for you when you think of imitation, when you think of imitating something, when you think of an imitator, what comes to mind for you? I have young boys, and you know, some of you do too. Some of you have younger brothers or younger siblings, and oftentimes we might think of imitation as, as something annoying, you know, where your little brother gets near gets near you and he's following you around and he's doing what you do and he's making the same gestures as you do and he's saying exactly what you say and you say, stop copying me. And what does he say? Stop copying me. <laughs> you say, stop it, I mean it. Stop it, I mean it. It's annoying, <laughs> right? So maybe that's what, what comes to your mind, but that, that is imitation. You know, or maybe you think of like the impersonators, like the, the Elvis impersonators. You go somewhere to some event and Elvis comes out and Elvis the king is still alive, right? And he comes out and he does his thing and he does his dance and he, he might sing a song and it looks and sounds like Elvis. When I grew up, I haven't, I haven't watched a show in a number of years, not because of any conviction necessarily, but, um, but growing up, I used to watch a show called Saturday Night Live, and a lot, you know, many of you know the show, and there's a guy that, uh, I don't know if he's still on the show or not, but Dana Carvey is an actor and comedian. He still is. I know he's still a comedian and actor that's, you know, that's still alive, and apparently, like I looked it up this week, he's still doing his impersonation, so one of the things I loved about him was he used to come out in these news segments on Saturday Night Live and do an impersonation of, um, of Ronald Reagan or of George Bush Sr. or Jr. or of Bill Clinton or you know, any of them, and, and this week I found out that he's, he's currently doing these of, of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and he's still unbelievably good and accurate in the way that he does this. So maybe, maybe you think of that, and that's, and that's accurate. That's, that's true. That is what imitation is. Imitation, the word here, imitators, um, the Greek word can be understood as uh, imitation or impersonation, of copying, of, of mimicking, uh, or of counterfeit. And the thing about imitation or counterfeiting or anything else is that it's supposed to, the intent is to look as close to the original as possible, Right? So Dana Carvey, when he's doing this, he wants to be just like George Bush or just like Bernie Sanders or whoever it is. And a counterfeit, you know, if you think of counterfeit money, the intention on the counterfeit money is to look as close to the original as possible. So that's what we're called to in this text. We're called to be imitators of God. Again, there's no higher calling. I mean, you think about that. You think about what we are called to in the life of the church. And something interesting that I didn't realize in studying this text is that this is the only place in Scripture that we're called to imitate God. So that, that, that stood, stood out to me. You know, there's other places where Paul says, imitate me as I follow Christ, or follow me as I follow Christ. You know, churches are called to imitate other churches. You think of the uh, letter of 1 Thessalonians where he's calling the church to imitate the faith and the generosity of another church. But only here are we called to imitate God. So how, how do you imitate God? Well, as any good impersonator knows, the first rule of imitation is to know your subject. We must know God. We must look at him and consider his being and his nature. We need both, we need to know, there, 
imitation requires knowledge and intentionality, okay? So you have to know your subject, and you have to intentionally, you have to work at it to, to craft it. Any good counterfeiter, and I'm not a counterfeit, I know very, I know nothing about counterfeiting when you think of money, promise. <laughs> But I assume that when they do that, they have to work at their craft. You know, I, I, I have a trade that I do professionally. Uh, I have a business you know, that I run and I have a craft that I, that I work at and, I, and it takes time to, to, to perfect your craft, okay? It takes intentionality, it takes effort, it takes striving and it takes working. Nobody, you know, just accidentally, you know, produces a counterfeit $10 bill, right? They work at it. And so it, is, so it is with this. So it is with the Christian life. Is it, it takes effort. Nobody just kind of happens upon holiness. Or I've heard it said nobody drifts toward holiness. It takes effort. It takes intentionality. It takes knowing your subject. So we have to intentionally study our subject and work at this. So how do we know our subject? How do we know God? We must look at him, consider his being and his nature. And we have, as we mentioned earlier, we have his word. This is his self-revelation where he says, this is what I'm like. You know, you, maybe, maybe you've heard uh, a lot of times, you've heard people trying to dispel religion or trying to talk about making an argument for plurality. Plurality is the view that there are you know, many truths, many, many gods, or polytheism. Well, that'd be, that'd be a little bit different. But, but they would say, they've used this analogy that, that the different religions are like blind men who are all groping an elephant and describing what they feel. Are you familiar with this? So you've got one guy who's describing a leg and is saying, well, God is like this. He has nails and it's and is planted in the ground and this. And then another guy is describing the tusk. And he's saying, no, no, that's not true at all. He's smooth and, and pointy and, and, and he has curves and then somebody else is describing the tail and say no it's he's hairy and, and all that well well that's all sounds fine and and whatnot except for the fact that with Christianity we have the, the elephant speaks the elephant says this is what I'm like you guys are you guys are getting little aspects true but this is who I am well that's what we have in his word so we have his self-revelation we have him speaking to us saying this is what I'm like that's what we have here. And so to study God, we look to his word. We look to his nature. We look to his attributes. And we have to recognize from the start, we'll never be perfectly like God. There are ways, there are ways that we'll never be like God, right? So there, there, there are ways that we can be like God imperfectly, but there are certain ways that, we, that we'll never be like God. So there are theologians that have divided these attributes of God into the incommunicable attributes of God and the communicable attributes of God. The incommunicable attributes of God, it's my $5 word this morning, are those that he does not share with us. They are not shared with us. They are, they are what makes God, God. Okay, so his in incommunicable attributes would include those that he doesn't share with us. So we will never be omniscient. We won't be, we won't share his glory the way that he is glorious. God is everlasting. He is from the beginning and will be to the end. We are eternal, but we, we have not been everlasting. We are not everlasting. We will not be everlasting eternality and everlasting are different. God is majestic. God, God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is all-powerful, and he is everywhere at all times. There's never somewhere that God is not. We will never be like that. But there are other attributes that are called the communicable attributes of God, and you know many of these. They're communicable primarily because they are moral in their nature. So the moral, the communicable attributes of God, these are the ones that we must understand if we're to apply this to our lives. These include God's holiness. So God calls us to be holy as I am holy. He never says be omnipresent as I am omnipresent. But he says be holy as I am holy. He says love as I love. We looked last week, we we're called in chapter 4 verse 32 to forgive one another as God has forgiven us. God is righteous. We are called to be righteous. His justice, we are called to be just. We are called to pursue justice in the land. This is an area, obviously, that's particularly applicable right now as our nation is reeling from, from these events this week. 
And so we want to respond as the church, not in fear, but in bold proclamation of who God is. And we want to demonstrate and reflect who God is to the world for the sake of his justice, for the sake of his holiness, for the sake of our neighbors, you know, for the sake of loving them. So all these attributes of God, these communicable attributes of God, we're expected to manifest. We're expected to have them. We're expected to show them that they're part of our life and our being. Remember, they're supposed to characterize our lives. So walking in love, walking means living, practicing, demonstrating. That should be characteristic of our lives. Be imitators of God, says Paul. But again, we're not just to be good people. We're to be imitators of God. We're called not to show what wonderful people we are. We're not called to, to say, look at how holy I am. We're not, you know, think of the Pharisees talking about, you know, look at me, everybody. I pray constantly. I fast twice a week, and I tithe of all that I get. It, that's, that's self-proclamation. That's self-glory. We're called to reflect the glory of God. This is the purpose of holiness. It's not an individual thing which is where we go wrong so often. Oftentimes, when we go wrong in our holiness, in our pursuit, we think it's all about us. Rather, we're trying to show the world about who God is. So our holiness, individually and corporately, is about proclaiming that God is glorious, that God is holy, that God is majestic, that God is worthy of our worship. When people look at us, they should see glimpses of the character of God. Not... Not that they would say, you know, yeah, that, that John or that Stan or you know, that David, or, you know, those guys are really good guys. But that they might see that hey, we're, just, we're just like anybody else. We're broken individuals who have been redeemed, who have been loved. He, we have experienced love. And it's only through that that we're able to reflect his love. Now, I want you to, I want you to see something in your Bible that's very important here. Um, the chapter divisions in your Bible, you know, we come this morning to a new chapter. And so you come to a new chapter and you think new topic, new idea, new direction. And that's often the case. But as, as I looked at this passage this week, and this wouldn't be Aaron's wisdom, but it's, it's helpful to recognize that the chapter divisions, while the word of God is inspired, the chapter divisions are not. So they're helpful and they're often and mostly accurate, but they're not inspired. So you don't need to think this is a division. So it would be unhelpful to take verse 32 last week, forgive as God and Christ forgave you, and to separate that from imitate God and walk in love. So if you look at the very last verse there of chapter 4, the, very, the one right prior to where we are this morning, he says that. He says, forgive one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Do you see that connection? What Paul is calling us to is basically he's summarizing what he has said previously. He said all these things about let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another. What he's saying is throughout here, he's, he's saying be like God, imitate God. That's why it says therefore, you know, therefore in light of all this. So, Forgive one another to the degree that God in Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God. Speak truth to one another as God speaks truth to you. Imitate God. You be kind to one another as, as God in Christ has been kind to you. Imitate God. Listen, what Paul is saying here is that what we're called to imitate is what we have experienced, is what we have seen on display. We're not called, you know, you, you're not just called to do something that we're not given or that we're not shown, but we're called to reflect what God has given to us. What you have experienced from God, we're called to imitate and reflect toward, other, toward others. What you have experienced from God, that we imitate and reflect toward one another. But then notice something right there at the end of verse 1. He adds something to it. He says, as beloved children... Notice this doesn't say, be like God, and you will be his well-loved children. It doesn't say, walk in love, and therefore I will love you. That's, that's not the gospel, friends. That's legalism. That, that is works righteousness. That is contrary to the gospel. We are well-loved children only because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. 
We are well-loved children because of that only, because Jesus died in our place. And as a result, we are called sons and daughters of God. And he loves us. He shows us affection. He is kind toward us. All we know is his grace and his love. Therefore, we are his children. And as his children, we're called to be like him. We're called to carry on the family name, the family reputation, the family resemblance. You know, our children usually you know, look something like us. People look at my sons and they say, yeah, they look, they look like Mayfield. They look like, they look like their dad. They look like one another. There's a family resemblance there. And, and what Paul is saying here is that that's what we're called to. We're called to carry on the family name. We're called to look like God, our heavenly father. That's the leading, that's the main thing that you've experienced from God is his love. You are his beloved children. You are greatly loved. You are dearly loved. Now, uh, for many of us, we can think back and reflect on the love that we experienced from our parents, our father, um, and, and we can think about glimpses of ways that that was like, that that is like the love we experienced from God, and then others of us don't know that, and it, that's a foreign concept. Some of us think of our parents and think of our dad in particular, and, and, and that's, you know, love would not be the first adjective that we describe. Now, I want, I want my children, I want them to know that love from me. I want them to experience that kind of love from their dad. And, uh, dad, you know what I'm after here. I want, I want my kids, I, I want... I want to be the man that they need me to be. I want to model what it is to be a man. I want to model what it is to be a husband. I want to model what it is to be a father. I feel this desire to serve them and to lay my life down for them. And, and at, at times, you know, when, you, when you're praying and you're asking God to do, to do this, you're, you know, at times my heart is just, I'm just aware of my weakness. I'm just aware of my inability to do this perfectly. Because I, I am imperfect. What God has called me to is more than what I can do. But that, that love, that yearning that I experience for my kids, that, that love, the best love that you can imagine in this world is only a tiny, small fraction. It's just a glimpse. It's just a small representation of God's heart toward you as his children. God loves perfectly. God does not fail. He has no weakness. See what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God, beloved children. God loves us with a tenderness, with a compassion, with a patience and a faithfulness, especially faithfulness. Think about how many times throughout the scripture does the Bible speak of God's steadfast love? How many times do you hear about God's faithfulness? Think of the Psalms and how many Psalms there are that sing and that proclaim God's steadfast love for his own. For his own, beloved children. We are God's beloved children. J.I. Packer, as many of you know, if you don't know J.I. Packer, I would strongly commend to you to get to know J.I. Packer. He's an old man now, but he's written a number of books that have served this church so well, that have served my soul so well. If you want one place to start, knowing God should be on the reading list of every Christian for all time. Knowing God is a phenomenal book that talks about who God is and talks about the attributes of God. And it's not like this, you don't think of it as like this uh, ivory tower intellectual book it it's it, it he is an intellectual but he writes it as with a heart of devotion someone who has experienced god's love and wants to make that known so j.i packer wrote this in his book knowing god which again strongly commend that to you he says if you want to judge how well a person understands christianity find out how much he makes of the thought of being god's child and having god as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. So what, what do you think of that? What do you think of, when you think of Christianity, when you think of the gospel, when you think of God, do you think of him as a loving father? Do you think of him as your dad who loves you and showers affection for you because 
This is the truth. Listen, if you are a Christian, you are a deeply, patiently, tenderly, faithfully beloved child of God. You are loved. He rescued you. He redeemed you. He has showered you with affection. That is his love. He adopted you. That is his love. He made you his heir. And now, now you are secure. Now, what does the word say? Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And listen, you should glory in that. You should rest in that. That should bring you peace. That's where we're called to live in the love of God. You are loved by God. That's the truth. And that brings us to our second point. We are called to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We don't want to move on too quickly. We don't want to move so quick from what we believe to what we're called to do. There's so many of us, you know, especially the administratively oriented, the action oriented people who say, just, just tell me what I need to do. You're going to walk out of here today with a list of what you're called to do. The primary thing that I want you to do today is to remember who you are in Christ. The primary thing I want you to remember today is your identity as a child of God, loved, holy, and beloved, secure in Christ. That is your primary thing today to do. It's not primarily to go out and to do something, but it's to go away in awe of God, in awe of him, worshiping him, and it's only in that, it's only as a result of that, remember our behavior is driven by what we believe in. So we believe that we are children of God and therefore we are called to walk in love as Christ loved us, as he gave himself for us. Well, in the second half of this letter, we are, we've already been called a, a few times to walk a certain way, right? And to walk is you know, a metaphor for living a certain way, to practice a certain way, to do something a certain way. We're called in chapter 4, verse 1, to walk in a manner of worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In chapter 4, verses 17 and following, he says that we must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, but he calls us to walk in holiness. So he calls us to walk not in sin and given over to a list of things that he mentions, but called to be holy. And now in chapter 5, verse 2, we're called to walk in love. That means that our thinking, our attitudes, our behavior, they're all called to be characterized by this love of Christ. The love of Christ should perfume all that we do. Even when we're rebuking people, we should only be, you, we should never rebuke unless it's out of love. Listen, if you, if you don't believe that God can change somebody's life, you don't dare bring something to them as something for them to change. If you don't believe that God can do that, because they will, they will hear that, they will pick up on that. But we are called to approach one another, to love one another, to speak to one another, to hold each other accountable because of love that we have. So Paul's point, again, throughout these verses is that what we're to do is only what we've experienced. What we've experienced from God, that we're to do for others. So only those who have experienced the love of God can reflect the love of God. That's another way of saying that. Those who have experienced the love of God are called to reflect the love of God, but only those who've experienced the love of God can reflect the love of God. Friends, there's a, there's a principle here, and it's a significant principle that we see throughout the Bible again and again. It's that God did something first. God acted first. God moved first. God did something first. He loved us in Christ. And what God has done for us is what motivates us and what enables us to do what he's called for one another. It shapes the way that we apply this. So how, what kind of love do we love with others? Well, the same kind of love that we've experienced. I'm going to say that again. God did something first. He loved us in Christ. And that, what God has done for us, that is what motivates us and enables us and shapes the kind of love that we love one another with. The Apostle John says it clearly. You don't have to flip over there. We'll put it up on the screen. But the, the letter of 1 John says this. Listen to this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 
In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, I'm sorry, stop there. We love because God first loved us. It's not the other way around. God doesn't love us because we loved him. And therefore, what it says there, that those who have experienced the love of God are called to reflect the love of God. Those who have been loved by God are called to love others. Do you see that principle? That what God calls us to is only what we has shown us. What God has done through Christ, he's enabled us to do. He calls us to love each other. He enables us to do it. He doesn't just call us to do it, but he gives us the ability to do it. And he shows us how to do it. He's given us a new life, a new identity. From that new life flow new desires, new attitudes, new abilities and ways of thinking, new ways of acting. We are new creations. The former things have passed away. All things are made new. What Paul is saying, what it means, what he's saying to the church, what he's asking us, he's asking what does it mean to be the church? And in light of the first three chapters of doctrine, learning about what God has done, who we are as a result, he's asking how are we supposed to live? And the answer is that that which we've experienced from God, we are called to replicate, to imitate, to reflect toward others. We're to show others who God is. Remember what First John says, nobody has seen God. How do they know God? By seeing him at work in us, seeing his character in his children. If you want to know something about me, look at my kids, and you will see little image bearers of me in certain ways, certainly. <laughs> and that's what we're called to. We are called to imitate our Heavenly Father, to replicate, to duplicate, to multiply, because he first loved us. Now we can love one another. So that's what this love is. What is love? That's what this love is. You want to know what love is? Look to God. You want to know what love is? Look to the cross. That's his love demonstrated for all time for all of us. Love is a way of doing life with one another that flows out of hearts that have been ransomed, that have been changed, that have been rescued, that have been transformed and made new. That's what love is. Because left to ourselves, we can't show that. Left to ourselves, I want to, in the midst of conflict, I want to scream, that's not right. You are wronging me. I want to impatiently demand and insist upon immediate and total change. In the midst of conflict, I want, to, I want to hold somebody ransom for their sin and say, until you change, I'm not forgiving you. But that's not, that's not the way that God relates to us, is it? God doesn't insist that we change before he loves us. He loved us first, and then he helps us to change. And you think about, I mean, you think personally for a minute about areas in your life that you have sought change in, that you've prayed for God to help you change. You've prayed to grow in patience or humility or, or whatever it is. And did it happen overnight? Has it happened yet? And yet God is patient with us. And so we want to be patient with one another. We want to reflect hearts that have been changed to one another. But there's still another piece to our love. If you look with me at verse 2, it says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Walk in love. Carry out your actions in love. Live your life reflecting love. Let this love characterize and perfume all that you do as Christ loved us. Well, that word as, as Christ loved us. As can mean a couple of different things. It can mean simply, you know, two people are doing the same thing. So, um, so two people are playing basketball. If you watch John and I play basketball, or let me, let me not do me. If you watch John and uh, Kevin Durant play basketball, you see what I'm doing there? 
you will see a disparity in the quality of ways that they play basketball. <laughs> One will be superior to the other. But they're both doing the same thing. Or you can have two people doing the same thing and they're doing it in the same way. So a son plays baseball the same way his father did. When I played baseball, when I was growing up, I used to watch, uh, you know, my, my team is the Texas Rangers because I'm from, from the Dallas area. And I used to watch Ruben Sierra. And when he'd come up to the plate, he'd have, he'd have this certain swagger when he came up to the plate. And so when I went to the plate and I played basketball, baseball, I would go up there and I would imitate him. I would do the same thing in the same way that he did. And when I made contact, it would go out of the park the same way that Ruben Sierra did. So let me tell you about my major league career some other time. That's not the point today. But that's what we're called to here is we're called to do the same thing in the same way. And that's what, that's, what, that's what Paul is intending here, the second stronger sense. Not just that we do the same thing, but we do it in the same ways. Not that we just love in our own way, but that we love as Christ loved us. As Christ gave himself for us. So not only does God's love enable and motivate our love, but it shapes our love. The kind of love that we're called to demonstrate should look like Christ-like love, sacrificial love. And we can be confident, this isn't just me. If you look later in chapter 5, he talks about, he's speaking to husbands, and he says in verse 25, Now husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then having described that, what that looks like, he says in verse 28, In the same way, husbands should love their wives. So here in verse 2, Paul is not just saying that Christ loved us, but that he loved us in a particular way. And he showed his love to us in a certain way, a self-giving way, that says God's love toward us in Christ is both what enables our love toward one another, it gives shape to our love toward one another, and that's what we're called to reflect in love toward one another. We are to love one another in ways that we are willing to give of ourselves for the well-being of each other just like Christ did for us. Clinton Arnold is a Bible commentator that says this. He says, Christ's love for his people is both the reason and the pattern for living a life that is characterized by love. It's the reason, so it's the motivation and the pattern it gives shape to. So it motivates us and it tells us like this. When I teach my kids how to throw a baseball, I say like this, and I teach them how to grip the ball, and I teach them how to throw the ball like this, son. And, and here, God is saying, you want to know how to love? Love like this. Look to Jesus. There's a, in, in the 90s, I think it was just in the 90s, uh, there, were these, uh, there was this cultural phenomenon, these bracelets in the, in the Christian church. You remember these, WWJD? What would Jesus do? And they went on to be kind of, kind of quirky and weird, and people, you know, mocked them and made fun of them. And you know, understandably, um, you know, sometimes we're we're silly and mock worthy. But the really the essence of of what those bracelets were is, is is what this passage is. He is calling us to do what Jesus did, you know, in the same way. So when when we live when, in the midst of my conflict, I mean, this is a very real principle that I want to arm you with in the midst of your conflict, and you will, in fa you will encounter conflict today and tomorrow. Every day you're, you're given opportunities to apply this. And every time, think to yourself, you know, I mean, whether you want to say, what would Jesus do, or if that just brings up you know, laughter for you, whatever, think, how would God respond to this? It is a helpful thing. What would Jesus do here? What would Jesus say to my wife here? What would Jesus say to my child here? Would he yell and say, I told you three times already? Would he insist, you know, you're the problem and you need to change? Would that be his posture? I mean, really think about how God relates to you. Think about the way that he postures himself toward us. That, that's how we're called to love. The model and the ground of our living a life of love is the love of Christ, the sacrificial, atoning work that he accomplished on the cross. While we will never atone for the sins of another, we are called to, to humble ourselves, to lay our lives down.
for one another, to imitate God in this way. And when Jesus did that, Jesus was not passive in the way that he laid his life down. He was intentional. It was a work of love. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was no unwilling victim that we cry for and say, poor Jesus. Nobody took his life from him, right? What does it say? He says he laid it down for us. And so we should willingly and eagerly, as hard and painful as it is in that moment, you know, when you feel wronged or when you feel like, you know, what, hap what needs here, somebody needs to be rebuked. Even if that's the case, we're called to do it in a way that demonstrates humility and love and sacrifice. That's what the world needs. The world doesn't need self-righteous people wagging our fingers at them. The world needs to see people of God reflecting the love of God, proclaiming the gospel of God, all for the glory of God. That's what we're called to. We're given the motivation. We're given the pattern. And we're given the ability to do this because of what we've experienced. The only way that we can do this, though, as I said at the outset, the only way we can do this is not by going out and just having it on our to-do list, okay, be loving, commit an act of love today, you know, okay, show love. The way that we're going to do this is if we leave today more aware of what Christ has done for us than anything that he calls us to do. By meditating upon the gospel, by looking to the gospel, by studying the gospel, by being experts in the gospel, by considering how great his love toward us has been and shouting, what love? What kindness, what mercy have I experienced? What patience, what tenderness, what, what forgiveness have I experienced from God? Thank you, Father. Thank you for your kindness to me. Now help me to show that to others. What a Savior. Friends, it's only as we experience the love of God that we can manifest the love of God in our lives. So don't move on from there. Stay there. Think on the love of God. Manifest. Look to embody that as you consider that, as you soak in that, as you daily counsel yourself when you're just overwhelmed with shame and guilt and aware of your weakness. Remind yourself of the love of God. And in doing that, you're going to naturally overflow in love toward others. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, this morning we, we are so grateful that you are God who has revealed himself to us. You have spoken to us. You are speaking to us. You are living and active. You minister to us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the love of Christ that we've experienced. We thank you for the love that compelled him to go to the cross, to die in our place, that we might stand here this morning righteous in your sight, not because of our own deeds, but because of his. We thank you, Father, that all that we know from you is love. That's the truth of it. When we feel it and when we don't, we know your love. That's what moves all of your actions toward us. And so, Father, now this morning, I pray, God, that you would help us to leave today, not with a to-do list of ways to go out and do, you know, show love primarily, and I pray that you would help us to know the love of Christ. That that would be the functional identity that we have is beloved children of God. Who are you? I'm a child of God. Father, help us. Help those to be true words this morning. And Father, help us to walk in love. As so we think about what it means to imitate you we see that application to walk in love. Help us to do that, Father. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Overwhelm us with your love. And let us 
joyfully and zealously and self in a way that is self-sacrificial, God, love one another. Give us opportunities today and this week and enable us by your spirit to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.